The next day, the uh, the lady was driving a car with her two biological daughters. She had a car crash, wrote the car off without a scratch or a bruise to anyone in the car. And she said to me, Mike, what was a miracle was that two days later, the day before you were due to arrive at Sydney Airport, the insurance money had been returned to our bank account and it was to the exact dollar that was needed to pay for your adoption. Mike Gore is no stranger to a microphone. With more than 20 years leadership experience, he shared passionately about his work with countless people. He's the previous CEO of Open Doors Australia, who work with and advocate for persecuted Christians all over the world. His latest venture is changing the way we give to charities and not-for-profits. Charitable is Australia's first app-based giving platform, basically a one-stop shop for generosity and donations. I'm so excited to have Mike with me in person. It's so rare that this right. happens on the Finding Hope podcast. Welcome to Finding Hope, Mike. Georgia, thanks for having me. It's actually, how good does it feel to be sitting in a room together? Oh, especially after COVID, the amount, uh, look, I love talking to people over Zoom, but it's so nice to not have a screen between us. Yeah, and the awkward pauses over Zoom. I mean, they're okay, but it gets a little bit like, a little bit draining. There's no, there's no yeah. lag here. There's yeah. no lag in person. Mike, let's take a walk down memory lane for you to start with. In school, when you were asked the the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did you ever envisage yourself being a leader, a CEO of sorts? No, like to be honest, a, a cricketer. Like I grew up playing cricket. Cricket was my sport. Um, I've got a whole story before I find myself here or even in school, you know, born in India, adopted when I was six months old, all sorts of um, interesting parts there but my dad was a cricketer my adopted father so white australian guy um me being a good indian heritage boy cricket was my thing i was good at it and so growing up i guess all i ever dreamed of being was a professional sports player knew nothing about leadership business ceo or any of that sort of stuff um i just wanted to play cricket tell me a little bit about that childhood obviously there is inherent trauma in in adoption anyway um and you know being you're growing up in a white family. Like, how 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 was your childhood growing up? Did you ever sense any of that kind of hardship? I mean, that is that is such a broad question, a great question, but a broad question. <laughs> mm. um, originally, and and for the listeners and viewers, you know, I was born as a Hindu in India. I was abandoned at birth, uh, from what I understand, and, and found by a pediatrician in a field. Within India, there is a, a religious system, I guess, of oppression. I'd call it. It's called the caste system, mm. where you're you're classified by the way in which you're born determines, I guess, the hierarchy, your family of origin, and within Hinduism, they they believe that what you've done in your previous life, Georgia, determines the circumstances amidst which you were born. And so, for me to be left in a field abandoned by a biological mother, uh, was was a heinous kind of viewpoint of what I must have done previously. So, placed into an orphanage, but unable to be adopted because of the belief that whatever I've done in my previous life had determined the circumstances amidst which I'd been born and therefore did not qualify for adoption. That was in 1981. In 1977, a family in Australia with two biological daughters of their own, Christian family, they had applied for an adoption. But over the following four years, heard a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape and and basically nothing conclusive about adoption. Mm. So in 1981, the year that I was born, they decided on giving up on adopting a child. In fact, they wanted to close that chapter. They spent the money they had saved on a trip to Disneyland, believe it or not, with their two <laughs> biological daughters. I mean, the happiest place on world to close a chapter and move on in life. So they decided to to do that and, and go to America and forget about the hope of adopting a child. While I was placed in this orphanage, a lady there called Vimala, uh, I don't know her, I've never met her, know nothing more than her by name on a piece of paper. She took a liking to me. And one night she grabbed me and she smuggled me across a state border. She took me to another orphanage run by nuns. She bribed them with cash, as the story goes, asked them to change my birth certificate so that I could be adopted under a different state law. And ultimately, that's what happened. The nuns accepted the bribe. They changed my birth certificate and I was therefore eligible to be adopted. This family got back from their trip to India with their two biological daughters. They got a phone call saying the adoption has gone through and your son will be at the airport at the weekend. And they said, no way, not a chance. I mean, we can't afford it. We have no money. And as a Christian family that night, they prayed. I'm sure those prayers that night were not necessarily your atypical, you know, God, everything's going to be all right. They were like, my gosh, help. Anyway, the next day, the, uh, the lady was driving a car with her two biological daughters. She had a car crash 
wrote the car off without a scratch or a bruise to anyone in the car. Oh my goodness. And she said to me, Mike, what was a miracle was that two days later, the day before you were due to arrive at Sydney Airport, the insurance money had been returned to our bank account and it was to the exact dollar that was needed to pay for your adoption. Get out of here. Not a dollar more, not a dollar less. And so that was how I ultimately ended up in Australia. But, but I mean, it's a very, very long-winded way of answering your question. Mm. But uh, the, the hand of God to sort of pull me out of that nation is undeniable. But that's not where the journey ended. In many ways, it's where it began. Mm. Because I grew up in the Sutherland Shire in Sydney, the southern suburbs. Uh, I was the only brown skin kid in school until I was 16. I remember... Um, all sorts of issues. I remember walking across the playground as uh, must have been in year four, a girl in year six walking up to me and saying, you're black mother and spitting all over me. I have had people come into my front yard with hockey sticks. I still have racism most months as a 42 year old now living in Northwest Sydney could tell you story after story after story that would blow your mind. And so when it comes to my experience of adoption, it's actually been overwhelmingly good, right? Because where I found a sense of identity in particular for me was in the church, Georgia. Mm. Right, I was at school and man, I was looked at as a different person everywhere I went. I mean, my middle name is Kartik. It was my Indian first name, but my parents changed it to be Michael Kartik Gore. And, and that allowed me in 1981 to fit into Australian culture. Yeah. I'll tell you what, every single time you went to school and they said, we're going to read the role today and read everyone's first middle and surnames, I always cringe thinking oh, that's going oh, to that. get to that point where they can't yeah. pronounce that name and everyone's going to know. And, and so those kind of things at school, I was always different. Every room I ever walked into, I was different. The only brown kid in any basically room I've ever walked into. But at church, I was always just one of the Gore family. So I could turn mm. up with my parents and my two sisters and I would be chastised as much as anyone else when I was doing things wrong. The ladies at morning tea, they treated me lovely, but they'd also reprimand me. You know, I was just me. And so the church helped really forge a sense of strong identity to loving parents that have helped shape and grow and develop my identity. So yeah, there has been traumatic elements to it, mm. but the, the, the sort of firm foundation to it all has been some fantastic parenting, a church community that gave me a sense of identity and have built me up to to drive me to what I do today, which is hopefully devote a life towards generosity. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you so much for for sharing, um, Mike. Wh what was the kind of point as you as you were growing up? You obviously said you know you wanted to be a cricketer. Was there a point where you like I don't know you realize it like your your calling was somewhere else? So you realize you could actually kind of do this whole this whole leader thing and really kind of guide others, or was it something you more fell into, or a bit of both? Yeah, look, it's it's entirely that the latter is that I fell into it. I, I um, I'm a fairly passionate believer, and this is not to to make you feel weird. Is that I'm like, I think if anyone says you need to be called to something, run. Mm. Right? I have a totally different lens on that. I mean, the amount of times I've heard Christians speak the word over people, particularly when it comes to not for pro not for profit work or church work, you must be called to work here. If you ever hear that, run. Right, because my calling is to love God and to love people. Yeah, I can do that stacking shelves a target. I can do it leading organisations, and I can do it being a father or a parent. Right, and and my wrestle is I watch it destroy people's spiritual worth and values when they either feel like I didn't get the job but I felt I was called to it, or I lost my job but I was called. And what happens in the middle of that is an incredible fallout spiritually. And so I'm a firm proponent of saying it's not about calling. Our calling as Christians, male, female, young, old, is simply to love God and love people. So I've never really chased a job in my life. Right? I have worked at different places. I started out in, in sort of my working in the Christian world at Kurong, a bookshop, but moved through the ranks there, not applying for anything, but just saying yes to everything. Mm. If someone gave me an opportunity, well, I chased it and I did it. But I've never chased a title. I've never chased a salary and I will refuse to do so ongoingly because I think if we're not careful, we need to be focused on living a life more defined by who we are, not what we do. And if I look around society and culture today, it is a world where people define each other based on what they do, not on who they are. And I think that's a great risk for all of us, but Christians in particular. Mm. And you've had such a, I guess, different experience of what 
Christianity is, especially with, with your work with Open Doors. Um, I want to ask kind of how did you remain hopeful in such painful and hard situations? You were faced with, you know, the, the harder stuff every single day, you know, having to relay that to the rest of the <laughs> Australia who might don't really understand kind of what true persecution is like often. How did you personally kind of deal with that? I think that's one of the big, the big challenges was actually understanding that that the persecuted church is, is overwhelmingly a story of hope. I mean, you cannot look at it any other way. In Western cultures, we too often measure our proximity to God based on his provision of safety. So, Georgia, we say, hey, God is good and my life is going well when, when things are going well. Right? God is near, God is close. But what I learned in the persecuted church, it's a paradigm of the persecuted church, or the paradox is that it's often almost the opposite. They would say, we would say in the West that suffering is an absence of God. They would say it's a drawing near of God. Same with persecution. If faith doesn't cost you something, then you're probably not shaking enough cages. It's part and parcel of the faith journey. But you come forward 2,000 years from Christ's time on earth, and in Western cultures, we often only preach a highs gospel, right? a gospel earmarked by blessing, uh, prosperity, wealth. I've seen a lot of Christians survive persecution, but very few prosperity. And I think it's one of the great challenges of the Western church is success, right? Has often bred a sense of ego that will ultimately edge God out, E-G-O. And I think that's what I've learned in the persecuted church. It's paradoxically different. It doesn't mean that we should chase suffering. And, and the naive interpretation of that in Western cultures is that you see people, they chase persecution more than they chase Jesus. So they say needlessly inflammatory things, trying to elicit a response saying, hey, I'm putting my hand up and I've been persecuted. No, no, no. What I see in the persecuted church is people take, chase Jesus. Out of the overflow of chasing Jesus, there is often a cost, and that cost can have a variety of labels being persecution, a mixture of violent or nonviolent. In Western cultures, our naive misinterpretation of that is that we can chase persecution over Jesus. So we get involved in conversations about things like gender, values, morals, society, and then we put our hands up and say, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. No, no, no. You're being naive and saying like ignorantly inflammatory statements that actually do not denote the viewpoint of Jesus. That's not persecution. I love what you said that if uh, your faith isn't costing you something, you're not shaking enough cages. What does that look like in the Western church where there is such a, a lack of persecution among Christians, really? Well, one of the things I, I have learned with the persecuted church is that it's the acts of non-violent persecution that are far more effective at suppressing the church than violent. And what I mean by that is it's when culture sort of overwhelms the church and leaves you uh, relatively ineffective, inefficient. And, and that's the, the best form of persecution. And that's rife within Western culture, right? And I think we often can say, well, well, look, it's our lives aren't as hard as this and we're not being persecuted like they are in the Middle East. And well, no, actually, it's probably worse here. You know, worse in many ways because it's the nonviolent persecution that renders us complacent, slow moving. And I think that's one of the real challenges for the Western church is that we need to, to know what it means to courageously follow Christ. And that means, I think, discipleship, like under those kind of settings, I would say that discipleship is a far greater importance of the church than evangelism because it's out of the overflow of a truly courageously discipled relationship with Christ that true evangelism happens. Whereas we've come up with a gospel that is often success measured by numbers. You don't feel like a good enough Christian unless you're evangelizing or talking to your non-Christian friends. Well, actually, what I think we need first to do is focus on discipleship, get back to understanding. And when I say discipleship, I mean of lifers, you know, multi-decade serving Christians, people who have been in church for years and years and years. I think that's of absolute importance to the forward movement of the church in this country. And what does that kind of look like practically, like day to day? Um, you know, if we were to go out and disciple others... I think what do you imagine? Look, I think in today's world, it's embracing what I would call the messiness of life, understanding that bad things happen to good people. To be honest, things like divorce will happen within Christian communities. Things like LGBTIQ plus issues will emerge within Christ parent, like Christian parents because our kids are growing up in a different society. I think unless we start to learn what it means to have a realist gospel, to embrace the breadth of the messiness of life and to realize that God went to the cross for his love for you, me, 
ISIS, LGBTIQ plus people, whatever it might be, no one is beyond salvation. doesn't mean we worship the same God. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that no one is beyond salvation. If Saul wasn't, then you know what? My family member or niece who is wrestling with gender means she's not either. And I think for us, discipleship means understanding the breadth of Christianity, the messiness of life, and learning how to follow Jesus in a rapidly evolving and changing world. Because actually, the message of Jesus doesn't change, but the method of delivery must. Mike, let's talk um, about your current work, Charitable. I love what you're doing. Uh, For those who have never heard of Charitable, what is it? And what are you aiming to do with this platform? Yeah, thanks. Look, it's a... uh, it's Australia's kind of first app-based donation platform. I think that um, having worked for 12 years with Open Doors 7 as CEO, I really built it for to solve the problems for that charity, but realized, you know, apps cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars to build. I mean, they are very, very expensive. But for me as a generous person, I don't actually want um, hope and compassion, all these other people to go around and having to spend all of the cost of technology on their own thing. So I thought, man, what if we just created like the Uber Eats of giving or (laughs) like the menu log or Amazon or whatever it is? Because if I'm honest and for for most viewers of this podcast or listeners and for you and I, Georgia, I'm like, there's five C's I call it that we want in life these days. We want to have choice, right? And so we want to have convenience. We want to have confidence. We want to have a sense of community and we want to be in control, right? So if I think about it in life, I live in app to do that. I live in like things like Amazon or Uber Eats. They give me choice. Uh, they're secure. They give me confidence. They give me control. I can order what I want, when I want. Um, they're convenient because they can buy in all these other places in one kind of setting, right? And they allow me to have a sense of community and be part of something bigger. Mm. And so charitable is that. It's like the Uber Eats of, of donating. You can find any charity you want. You get an annual giving statement whereby you don't have to go looking for receipts at tax time. Um, you can stay in touch by liking your favorite charities. Like you don't have to worry about having noise from other ones, but actually you can give quickly. Mm. You can keep the work of people going forward. And I think that's the biggest issue facing the not-for-profit sector. We have been inherently behind the eight ball because we say, man, my message matters most. If We need to keep our people with our people. And if they find out about anyone else doing something similar, we risk losing them. That's not true. They already know about it, right? <laughs> Because I'm a user. I already know about them. And, and on Uber Eats, I still order from my favorite restaurants. But you know what? I just use the scaffold of Uber Eats to do it because it makes my life easier. So that was my dream. Build something that made it easier for people to be generous and offer it to the breadth of society. Because if we can increase generosity, we can lower the cost of charities and therefore we can increase the impact of every dollar raised. What's been the most challenging part about the journey so far? You know, if I'm being raw and honest, I didn't realize what it would cost me. Um, not financially, but from an open doors perspective, I didn't really expect to find myself um, solely working in charitable as quickly as I did. I knew it would come, but probably not as quickly. So that, that's been a, a hard part of the journey. We have had um, some some negative press at times mm. because people will misassume, you know, in, in one particular instance, people misassume my skin color and in a secular environment labeled me as a scammer. And, um, and that's heartbreaking when people start calling you and, and, making assumptions, having not known you. So I didn't expect the cost of kind of the personal side of it in a, in a world of cancel culture. It's very easy to be canceled and, and you can't, you can't defend that. There's no way of sort of standing up to that. Um, The stress of providing a service that is new and disruptive, the hardest people to get on board at the moment are charities, not users. users. We've got users left, right and center wanting to give to charities, but we've got charities sort of being very, very cautious at the technology. And I get it but they're worried about competition. They can't see how you use an app. And well, we've got a website. Why do we need this? And and kind of pioneering new space is is something that we just need to be patient with. So they're not in and of themselves mission ending or destructive or negative. They're just hurdles that are time draining, emotionally draining and um, and hard to keep the, the energy going. How have you found the, the work-life balance? You know, you've you've got a wife, two beautiful daughters. Um, do you kind of find it hard to not bring work home, I guess? No, I've never found that to be the case. But I, what I am passionate about is involving them in my work. Mm. I think that, uh, so I've got a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old. And from as long as I can remember, I mean, Brooke, when she was 
you know, crawling would be sort of open doors events back in the day. And I think that's really important is that you can involve your kids in your work. Too often in life, we really talk about having clear boundaries. The reality is in a modern world, there, there aren't those clear boundaries. You can hold them rigidly, but actually you find you spend more energy in trying to be rigid about them and they you end up becoming beholden to them than I think if you went the other way and just kind of embrace them. And so, yeah, I involve them in in the work we do. And I also try and on a weekend, I'll challenge myself to say yes to everything the girls ask me to do. All right now, yes, there's frameworks. I mean, they know not to go and say, well, can we buy a car or what? Like, but if it's like, hey, can we play Barbies? Can we put makeup on you? Great. Um, you know, can we play tennis? Can we go outside? Can we do this? Just challenge myself to say yes, because it's a lot easier for me to go to the inbox or think about work. But by just saying yes to everything from them from Friday evening to Sunday night, it means that they have me my attention and my presence, but it doesn't mean that I'm setting hard boundaries. I could be journaling, I could be writing, but if they interrupt me and say, hey, can we do this? Yes, is my answer. What does, uh, I feel like so many of us, you know, have an idea of what a daily routine or a lifestyle of a CEO is like, and I'm guessing it's very inaccurate for most people. What does a daily routine look like for you? One of the great misnomers in, in the world is, look, the higher you go, the less you do. I mean, particularly when you have a team, <laughs> it's just the more emotional weight you manage. That was the biggest thing I noticed with Open Doors, being the CEO there. It was just under a $10 million organization, 30 staff across two countries. The higher I went, the less I actually did, but the more emotional weight of others I carried. And so we often can esteem CEOs and look to them, but actually the people, to be honest, and it's not a chivalrous thing, the people who do all the work are the people, inverted commas, below you. I mean, the only hierarchies in life are man-made, right? We, we like to esteem others or glorify others. But the reality is I had never, I'd never had more time than when I was a CEO to be able to drop the kids off at school or to pick them up. Uh, yeah, I had to carry the heavier, meatier topics and they came with a greater weight and a greater stress. But actually my job and my firm belief as a CEO is that value contribution and self-belief are linked. Right? When you know where and how you add value, you believe in yourself. So my job as CEO was simply to put people in positions where they could add value and then reinforce it through specific encouragement. Because Georgia, when you believe in yourself, when you know where and how you add value to the greater picture at hope, well, if you believe in yourself at work, you begin to believe in yourself at life, home, church, work, friendship circles. So my job as CEO is nothing more than help people reach their full, like full potential, put them in positions where they can add value and reinforce it through specific encouragement. It made it one of the greatest privileges and greatest jobs on the planet. But it's not crazy. It's not overburdening. I got up, I exercised, I was available for the kids. I wanted to make sure I lived that from the top so that if other families had sick kids, bring them to work. That's fine. I, I literally do not care mm. because ultimately we're all here serving together for the same cause. You want to go and leave early? It's not an issue rarely, sorry, genuinely in Christian circles of people working too little. It's usually the opposite, too much because Everywhere you go on a weekend, people ask you about your job and how's open doors or charitable or hope. It's not an issue of working too little. We need to understand that and embrace it and help people add value. How did you kind of deal with those heavier, meatier topics? You know, you said a bit about being an emotional weight, hmm. but it, it does take a toll. How did you kind of deal with that yourself? Did you have certain outlets or ways that you kind of work through them? Look, I love God and I love people, right? And so the privilege of walking people through, you know, complicated uh, fertility processes, uh, difficult marriages, um, hard work-based issues. I love coaching and developing people. So that side of it, it was weighty, but I am my best self when I feel like I'm adding value to helping people navigate those. And so for me, it was a great privilege um, to do that sort of stuff. Where I probably struggled more was the weightiness of things like banking and external conduct standards and board governance and those kind of things, which are well and truly outside of my um, my competency. It wasn't that I was I lacked competency. It just wasn't my jam. It didn't bring me to life. And so the weightiest subject matters for me were those elements of getting bogged down in real compliance-based stuff that I, I didn't feel confident in. I didn't feel like I lacked it terribly, but it just wasn't me. And so those kind of things, I would often look to others to get help. So I would reach out to people. I would 
open handedly say, hey, this is not my skill set. Can you help? I think that's one of the great challenges of CEOs is the ability to ask for help and never to be too proud to be kind. I am more than happy to say I literally have no clue about this. I may be the CEO, but I have no idea. Can you help? Mm -hmm. Value contribution and self-belief. Because if you are gifted in that ability to help, well, you're adding value. I reinforce it through specific encouragement and we all grow. Right? Never be too proud to be kind. We've talked a lot about leaders and, you know, what you've done as a leader, what you believe a leader should be. What actually is a leader to you? I think leadership is about influence. And that means that anyone can be a leader um, because it's all about a sense of influence. And if you have influence over others, then you're a leader. It can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And I think some of the greatest leaders in the world are some of been the most, some of the horrific ones, you know, and, and you look back through world history and some of the most horrific leaders are actually exceptional, exceptional leaders. Problem is they use their influence for bad. And so for me, leadership is simply about influence. What do you think is one of the, you know, I guess, biggest challenges facing leaders today? Ego is a really big issue. I think that um, it is the best friend of success. It is the destroyer of character and is the enemy of the church because ego will always edge God out. And I think we live in a society and culture that now more than ever espouses the number of likes you get based on you know, that's almost like the metric people use for success. How liked am I? How many shares do I get? How popular am I? How many people are reaching out to me? They're all elements that foster and fuel ego. And I think for leaders, that's one of our biggest challenges, particularly in the Christian world, particularly in the church world, right? Out of our best intention efforts to market, to promote, to grow the reach of Christ within our communities, we can inadvertently not realize that those tentacles of ego and success have sort of leached their way onto us and then we make it all about us and that's a big problem. Mike, talking to you, um, it's clear that you're, you're a very grounded person. Well, I, that's what I feel like. You're quite emotionally kind of grounded. How do you remain so? Because I think it's easy in in roles like you have and wearing so many hats to get kind of just a little bit frantic. How do you kind of remain in the present? I, I mean, I do a lot of work on that. Um, I would see a psychologist regularly. And, uh, and I think for any listeners out there, you know, unmasking some of the taboos around mental health. I, th I mean, I've seen a psychologist now for, I couldn't even tell you how many years. Same. And, <laughs> Therapy's and great. <laughs> it, it is like, it, it builds me up to be bigger, badder and stronger version of myself, right? I think that too often we've looked at that historically and gone, oh, that's, you know, all that sort of emotional touchy-feely stuff. No way. That's just like it's an incredibly important routine to calibrate yourself in leadership, but life in general. We um, do exercises outside of the psychologist, but for our teams that open doors, but now charitable, you know, we do exercises where monthly we're looking at what we call our buckets. We, we can often talk in life about the fact that, I mean, I'm feeling down today or I'm feeling up today or I'm feeling low today. And in a whole of life sense, it can affect our, our moods in our days. And so what we do is we break it down into four buckets. You have your physical, your spiritual, your emotional, and your creative. And what we do is we get people to go through and just plot their waterline, right? In the physical, are you active? Are you feeling where you want to be physically or low? Right? Spiritually, are you feeling close to God or distant from him? You don't have to be Christian. Like, are you feeling connected to a greater cause or not, right? Emotionally, do you have the capacity? So it's not about happy or sad. It's be about the capacity to carry emotion. Is it full or is it empty? And then creative, do you feel creative or not? And what you can find is actually, you know, I'm fit, I'm exercising, I'm active. My physical bucket's good. I'm reading my Bible. I feel sort of close and connected to God. That's pretty good. COVID, to be open and honest, man, it like punched holes in that emotional bucket and just drained it. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden that's just completely and utterly tapped out. And then creative is, is somewhat low for me. And I go, oh, there it is. That's a link, right? It's not that I feel rubbish in my whole of life. It's actually that my emotional bucket is just cooked and I, and I need to spend time replenishing that because there's a direct link between that and creative. And so people might go, great. So how, how do you replenish your emotional bucket? Well, actually what I'll try and do is work on the other two because I'll pull the others up, mm. right? And so I'll go make sure I stay exercising. I'll push back into the Lord. I might go and do something out in nature, go to the beach, um, take some photos, do some painting, do like something that brings up the buckets 
But that's a really important exercise in remaining grounded is realizing that too often we say, I feel good or I feel bad, I feel low or I feel high. No, no, break it down into buckets, get a picture of what part of your life and area is under pressure. And when you can do that, it really does, it changes everything. That's such important advice. And I think, especially when we're feeling low, it's hard, It's easy to just blanket statement, everything is terrible. Or even when you, you know, realize, you know, your emotional state's bad and then you, you really try and kind of force yourself to get out of that rut, but you can actually just focus on the other areas in your life and keep that has honestly changed, changed my whole perspective <laughs> on the whole thing. I'm going to try that when I get home. Mike, what gets you out of bed in the morning? I love God. I love people and I love building something out of nothing. If you give me a job that ticks those boxes, man, I'll jump out of bed a happy guy every day of the week. And um, and as I said before, my calling is not in what I do, it's in who I am. Love God, love people, love building something out of nothing. I can do it stacking shelves at Target or I can do it running an organization. I don't actually care what the title is. What I care about is I love God, I love people, and I love building something out of nothing. How has your faith evolved over the years that you've been doing this work, Mike? Obviously, you've known Jesus your whole life. You've been a part of the church your whole life. But I can imagine that, yeah, in the years doing this work, that your your view and relationship with God has evolved in countless ways. I, I've walked through a really difficult season in the last 10 months where I, I would say I've been on a bit of a bender with faith in that I have spent the last 10 or 12 months looking for freedom from God. Um, mm-hmm. But in that journey, I found freedom in God. And that's a really important distinction. And my guess is there are people watching this and listening to this that are in the same boat. There are people who are under the environmental pressures of the last three years and many other life pressures and all sorts of things. There are people who have been rock bottom spiritually. When you think of those buckets, spiritual, physical, emotional, creative, a link between the emotional and spiritual, you know, you get low in those buckets and it becomes a pretty difficult old prospect. And so I spent the last 12 months doing my best to run from God but I found freedom in God. And that's a that's a really powerful journey of which I'm still coming back. If I would say where I was three years ago, spiritually it was a 10, I'm a six, a fragile six. But embrace the messiness of life. Understand there is a highs and lows gospel and realize that it's a journey that makes us great, that God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And it's a journey that makes us great. Um, is really important. How did God, well, God never left you. How did God find you again? How did you find God again? Well, we controversial. I didn't find him in the church. Um, you know, I really struggled to reconcile some of the actions of Christians over the last 12 years um, who do it out of a lens of self-righteousness, but actually end up having a destructive impact on those around them. I really res- wrestle with that. In fact, I see a lot of that in the church today, people who would judge God based on their viewpoint and lens of the actions of Christians around them. The reality is, is there are no good people. In fact, Christians aren't good people. We are all broken people who acknowledge our need and desire to do good. The wrestle is, and I'm I'm as guilty in this as possible, is that we spend our lives trying to prove God's goodness by justifying to others our goodness. So we say, look, I'm a Christian and my life is good and I'm a good person. And because of that, God is good and Jesus is good and you should follow him. I'm like, it's a fundamental flaw of my evangelism and my guess is others, is that the longer I try and project God's goodness by, by, I don't know, living up to my own sense of goodness, my gosh, the bigger the friction is when there's a fallout. And so that's the journey I've been on is that I've struggled to reconcile Christian actions towards me in a variety, variety of settings, but then I've miss, like, place that in God, an act of God's injustice or justice or goodness or serving him or when I've devoted a life to this, how can I be here? And they're all warped, backwards, misunderstandings of faith. And I'm on a journey of, again, understanding a realist gospel, embracing the messiness of life because what I see echoed in the Christian world is we use the gospel as a guillotine for others and a pillow for ourselves. And I'm sick of doing it. Mike, you've been so generous with your time and your wisdom. Last question. For those listening that have what you would call maybe an empty or a low spiritual bucket, Mm -hmm. what, I don't want to say advice, but what encouragement would you give them? I think I would say that it's okay 
full stop because too often we can think, well, God mustn't be happy with me or I'm going to go into my shell and not talk about it. Um, I don't know how to language it. I feel alone. I feel distant. I feel like a bad Christian. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm doing things wrong. Maybe I'm not going to. All these things come up. I actually want listeners to know, hey, you're not alone. I was the CEO of an organization that supported the persecuted church. I mean, you couldn't get more, this guy must be 100% hooked in Christian charity than that, right? The persecuted church, CEO, Christian, speaking, public, all of those things. And the journey I've walked on, man, I, I was close, to giving it all in, right? And, and 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 I'm not ashamed of saying that. And people can look at you going, oh my gosh, is this guy? No, no, man, I still love God, always have. But I was close. And And if it can happen, I guess, to people like me, then you need to know it's normal and it's okay. But God has a purpose and a plan for our lives, and it's the journey that makes us great. I talk to friends and loved ones whose kids are off the rails, away from God, and I keep saying, just trust the journey. Trust the journey. We need to get better at trusting the journey, right? Because the longer we try and control, conform, manipulate, or make happen the journey, it just is stressful, anxious, panicky, all of these kind of things. We need to trust the journey, embrace the messiness of life, realize that sometimes life doesn't pan out the way we wanted it to, but it doesn't mean God doesn't love us and it doesn't make certain people not Christian. Right? I think if we can embrace a far more realist gospel that preaches the highs and the lows than for anyone listening whose bucket is empty, you know what I'd say to him? I love you. I trust you. Talk to me about the journey and we'll walk it together. Mike Gore, it has been a pleasure having you on Finding Hope today. Thank Thanks you so much. Me.